All right, y'all turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to continue our study today, and I'm going to try and, uh, for those watching, we're going to try and mix it up a little bit so it's profitable for everybody. So, um, Revelation chapter 2. Before we start, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for the chance to gather together and to worship Your name. Lord, we thank You for giving us Your Word, and we thank You for giving us of Your Spirit, that we might understand it. But above all things, we thank You for giving us Your Son. Lord, if You had not sent Your only Son into this world to die for us, there could be no salvation for sinners such as us. So we thank You eternally for that gift. We ask that we lift Him up and praise Him in everything that we say and do today. In Christ Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to uh, continue our study today in Revelation, and we're in chapter 2. Let's just read from the, uh, verse 8 first. <clears throat> now remember, where we're at is, in the first vision, John sees, uh, of the seven visions, this vision, he sees Christ, and then he has receives messages to seven churches. And the seven churches were real churches, but what it really amounts to, the number seven in the Bible, especially in Revelation, is, is God's number for completion or, or per perfection. So we're seeing a, a whole complete look at things. And in other words, in these seven letters, we've got advice to the church of all time, all types, all kinds, all kinds of members. You'll see in each one of these churches different things that address each of us. And today we're in uh, the second one, verse 8. Under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Now I want to just kind of go at this backwards to begin with. First thing I want to address is verse eleven. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Now, don't we all have ears? Yeah. I'm looking at everybody. We all got ears, don't we? Is that what he means? No. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Basically what he's doing is in each one of these churches, you've got to remember that there is the visible church in the world. There's the church that you can see, the people that profess to be Christians. You can put your finger and eyes on them and you say, okay, there they are, they're there. But within that group of people is the true church. The Bible talks about the church, the body of Christ. And it's made up of those that have truly trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, those that are regenerate. And when a person has been regenerated, what do they now have? The Spirit of God. And it's not hooping and hollering and jumping pews. I've got to say that all the time. It's not any of that stuff. It's, it's a, it's a basically starts like a new birth with a seed. And it's the idea of faith that comes into a person where they're now looking to the Lord Jesus Christ rather than unto themselves. In other words, I don't look to anything that I've ever done or could ever do to save me. Now, if I think there's anything I could ever do to save myself, I've never seen what I am. If I think there's anything I've ever done that merits God saving me, I'm not, not being honest about what I am. Now, what do we all merit? In other words, you want what you deserve. What do we all deserve according to the Scriptures? Death. Death. And? Is it? Death and hell. Eternal death. Mm -hmm. Death and hell. Look, a soul and a spirit, they don't go away. You're going to live on forever in one of two places. Now, the world today doesn't like talking about this. Um, there's a man that comes to class, and i, I got to go over there today, and he claims to be an atheist, and so he comes to class. He thinks he's irritating me is the reason he comes, just to needle me and bother me. <laughs> but I really find him kind of fascinating because of the things he says. Because what he says sounds so intelligent to him. And yet these little old ladies that are saved that just look at him and they just answer him so plainly and make him look like such a fool. I never even really say anything to him because they just tell him the, the simplest things. Like uh, he told one of them one time, that's all a pipe dream. And she said, well, of course it is. You, honey, you don't have eyes to see. Oh, well, that's the truth. Isn't it? yeah. It's the absolute truth. Now, to understand this, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2.
All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells us, verse 14, but the natural man, now, what in the Bible is a natural man? No, the seed of Adam. It's all of us that were born in the flesh. You know, they talk about natural childbirth. <clears throat> he, I never understood when a lady said she's going to have natural childbirth. I always thought, what, what other kind could there be? Uh, but I assume that means without drugs or something of that effect, right? Yeah. Yeah, but natural birth is that all of us have been born naturally, haven't we? He says, the natural man. In other words, how we're born physically into this world. From a natural father and a natural mother, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now why not? For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. How can you understand the Word of God without the Spirit of God? You can't. You can be a scholar, you can memorize it, and you'll never understand it. And you, you can read passages and it's just totally dark to you. And then you might think that you're really understanding what you're reading, but what you'll find out is that everything that when you see in the Scripture, you apply it naturally. In other words, you look at the Scripture and say, well, I, all right, I've got to be good. You read the Sermon on the Mount, and you say, well, I've got to turn the other cheek if I want to go to heaven. Is that what it's saying? Nope. It's saying that Jesus Christ turned the other cheek when they hit Him because Jesus Christ wasn't a sinner. Slap a sinner in what usually happens. Well, you get slapped right. back unless that sinner's a coward, and then He won't slap you for to save, you know, save Him on self. But the point being is, if you're trusting anything that you've ever done, then are you trusting Jesus Christ? Y'all know when Israel, and back here God had Israel, His nation back here, and He chose them. And He called them out of Egypt. When they come out of Egypt, they didn't come out alone, did they? And he had a group there, His chosen people, but then they were within the whole nation, weren't they? Everybody that you saw come out of that Red Sea, were they God's children? God's children were in there among them. What did you find out over the course of the next 40 years in the wilderness? A whole bunch of them didn't trust the Lord. In other words, their faith was tested and they, they proved to be just professing to believe God, didn't they? And as they got into the land, the problem kept persisting. Eventually, God... Come on, Alice. Eventually, though, God uh, basically brings Nebuchadnezzar in later and he's going to carry him off into captivity, right? <clears throat> when the, Jeremiah was sent with the message to tell those people, look, chastisement's coming. God has declared that, you know, we have turned from God and we're not worshiping Him. All we do is look out for ourselves and enjoy the world. And because of this, God has got enough and He's going to, you know, bring doom and gloom on us here. Nebuchadnezzar was coming to town. While Jeremiah was preaching the true message to them, what did they have at the same time? Y'all ever read Jeremiah? He got a bunch of false prophets, and you know what they were preaching to the people? Peace and safety. That's what, that was their message, peace and safety. I'd like to tell y'all that we're in the same boat again right now today. I mean, literally, peace and safety is, is the message that most of Christianity is preaching. And I don't mean that America can't suffer hard times. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is this. How many people do y'all know right now that give God basically, I mean, they spend no time even concerned with God, yet if you ask them, they'll tell you they're okay because yeah. of something they did 30 years ago. Won't they? Because of a false kind of evangelism. And this only started in the last 100 and really 160 years. It's gotten real bad in the last 100, and it's gotten especially bad since Billy Graham. And I don't mean Billy Graham's going to hell. I don't know Billy Graham. But I know Billy Graham would preach that if a man would just get out of his chair at a meeting and walk down front and sign a card, that man's going to heaven. Well, what would that guy then do? Most of them. Don't worry about it. Right? I say, I got that taken care of. And they get on with life. You know, I have a friend like this who just doesn't want to even hear about God to say Jesus Christ, the hair on his neck, that makes him uncomfortable. Folks, if that's how you feel, that ought to be your first indication, shouldn't it? But what it basically boils down to is, when I tell him, aren't you concerned? No, I took care of that years ago. When I was seven, I took care of that. Folks, that ain't salvation. That's not real faith. I've had people tell me that their wife takes care of that for them. Sure, people say things like that. 
But Israel was in the same boat. And the preachers were telling them peace and safety. And the majority of the people that looked like God's people, what happened to them? Nebuchadnezzar come in there and slaughter them. Right? Do you know what happened to God's actual people? Jeremiah told them, pack your bags. We've, we've turned from God. He's sending us down into Babylon as chastisement. And the believers did what? They packed up and went. And you know what God did for them in Babylon? He took care of them. He took care of them, okay? See, <clears throat> I don't know what is going on with my throat. I guess. <clears throat> okay. So, when we come over here to the message and it says, he that hath ears to hear, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, what he's saying is the person that has been regenerated. So, ask yourself, do I have ears to hear? When I tell you something like this, Adam sinned. One man made a choice for an entire race of people. And that shouldn't surprise us because he's the progenitor of the whole race, isn't he? Look, if, if I start with a tomato seed, the choice is already made, isn't it? What will I get from that? Can I ever get anything else from it? It's impossible. Well, we started from the seed of Adam after he had fallen. He disobeyed God and therefore he's a sinner. And so what's the whole human race come from, from that point? We're sinners from Adam. All of us. You mean even my sweet old grandma? Yeah, folks, she's a sinner. How about that fellow in Italy with the big pointed hat that says he doesn't sin? He's especially a sinner. Okay? So then the point is, the Bible says, all have sinned and come, not came, come, continually come short of what God expects, the glory of God. Now, what is the requirement of a holy and righteous God to be in His presence? Righteousness. What does righteousness really mean? Yeah, without sin. Folks, righteousness means perfect. It means straight. Matter of fact, it means more than just straight. It means turn around and look back as far as you can and always having been straight. Now, anybody here can make that claim? How many sins ruins your righteousness? One. Don't we all have them? So what Satan does is Satan gets people to go and through, through false preaching and whatnot, he, he lessens the burden of sin on people by telling people that what we do is not sin. Aren't that what we're being told in our country today? I mean, everything that did... Look, my granny said would have said, that's horrible. What in the world? And yet, what are we told today? No, that's natural. Aren't we told that's not sin, that's natural. Well, they're half right. It is natural. The natural man is a sinner. So what does the natural man do? He sins. Now, again, this offends people, and the Bible says it will offend people. Nobody likes to be told you're no good. <laughs> he, but the point of the, uh, sorry, but the point is we are no good, aren't we? If we were good, like people say, I'm just a good Christian, okay? If we were good people, somebody explain to me why the Son of God had to leave glory and come die for us. God would have just said, be good, do your best, right? You know, people will say, well, I mean, I know I've sinned, but stop right there. What you're fixing to tell me after the but is something good about yourself, isn't it? I know I've sinned, but I'm not like so-and-so. Or I know I've sinned, but I always do this. Folks, it won't work with God. It absolutely won't work. He's holy and righteous, and you've got to be holy and righteous to go in His presence. Here we are. We're all admitting we ain't righteous in the flesh, aren't we? Then what's the only way you can go in? You've got to have Christ's righteousness put into your account. It's got to be written into your your uh, what's that ledger. column? Your ledger. ledger. There you go, James. Your ledger. Right? Yeah. That's what I needed, James. <laughs> so, whenever something is written into your ledger, you now possess it, don't you? Right? The Bible word is impute. It must be imputed unto you. Now, if it's imputed unto you, did you earn it? No. If you earned it, it's payment. You had it coming. But the Bible tells me that salvation is a gift. Well, how do you get a gift? I accept it. You accept it. It's gifted to us. Who is it gifted to? The whole human race? Nope. All those that will admit what they are and call on the Lord to save them. Oh, it happened here. 
all that have an ear. He, so the, the letters to these churches, basically what it does is, look, when, when these churches were written unto, I, I, let me just say it like this, you've got the church, all right, we'll, we'll, I'm just make the church in green because it's made up of all human beings, okay? So here we've got this church, visible on every corner throughout the world. And it's made up of natural human beings, isn't it? They make up the church. But when you read these letters to the churches, you see these people, but then you find out within this church, what do you have? You've got the true church. The true believers. You've got the church, the body of Christ. It's a spiritual body of believers. And what has God put to their account? Therefore, they, they at death go right into His presence, don't they? But if you profess to believe and you don't have that righteousness put to you, you can be the most clean living person that's ever. I mean, you can be Mother Teresa. Folks, I mean, I couldn't say absolutely, but I can say with 99.9% .9 that Mother Teresa went straight down at death. And I say that based on what she spoke about. Now, she was a wonderful woman socially, wasn't she? But what did she trust to get her into heaven? Her works. Her seven sacraments. Her works. She would she tell you she was going to heaven because she's been a good person. She had, takes co co communion. She gives confession. She takes the sacraments, right? Well, why didn't God just tell Jesus Christ, stay put, son. We'll just let him keep the sacraments. Couldn't he? But he didn't. And I know, again, I don't want to offend anyone, but I, I do kind of want to shock you into thinking about, look, you talk to most people in our country today and they'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm saved. And, and the next question is, what are you basing that upon? And listen to what they tell you. Lots of people will then begin to tell you something that they've done or something they've never done. In other words, well, I've never killed anybody, right? Or, well, I joined the church when I was 12 or I got baptized. How many people have gotten baptized at 12 years old, have then turned from God, chased the world the rest of their life, and yet in their mind thought they had security? We find these people at the second coming, at the resurrection, all are going to be resurrected now, even the lost, before being cast away. And what do they say to the Lord at the resurrection? Lord, Lord, to Jesus Christ, we believed on You. We did this work and look at this good thing we did and that good thing. And what does the Lord say to them? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Okay, so just everybody consider that deeply today, okay? Now back over to the letter. Revelation 2. Let's start dealing with this church at Smyrna. Now, y'all remember the letter to the church at Ephesus? If you could characterize that letter, it would be they had fallen away from their first love. They had left their first love. He, what, you know they say, uh, remember the Marilyn Monroe movie? Uh, I don't forgot, Seven Year Hitch. Remember the seven years? The whole theory was after seven years, what's the married man do? He starts looking around, starts wondering, thinking about straying. Well, that's kind of the picture of the church at Ephesus. They had begun to stray from the Lord. They had left their first love. Well, this church in Smyrna is a persecuted church. Now remember, it, this doesn't mean, well, that church down there in the corner is all of this, and that one over there is that. Folks, in every age you find these churches, and in every church you find these different characters. This applies to all of us, right? Now, first thing to notice, Smyrna. The word Smyrna means myrrh. Okay, you all know what myrrh is? It's an old ointment that they, that they used back then for a perfume, but literally, you know what the Bible tells us was the main use of it? Embalming, yeah. It's for embalming. So here's this church that's that's named after its city, the city of myrrh. Now think on that for a minute. In other words, the word myrrh comes from the name Mary. It means bitterness, persecution. And that's what this church is facing. Now, Smyrna is the persecuted. The Smyrna church probably heard the gospel from Paul. We don't have any record of it, but in Acts 19 it says... All Asia heard the gospel through the preaching of Paul. So whether it was through Paul or through someone that Paul preached to, either way, they, that's when they heard the gospel. Now, Smyrna itself, the city. The city was destroyed right around 600 B.C. by the Lydians. And it basically remained in rubble for 300 years. 
Alexander the Great rose up and the Greeks started coming that direction. Alexander conquered the known world in that area in about 14 years and he died. He died young. At 31 years old, he's dead. Now, he, he had divided his kingdom into four parts and gave it to four generals. He didn't have any sons to, to give it to, so he gives it to these generals. One of these generals is the one that decided to rebuild this city, Smyrna. If you look on the map, Smyrna's still there today. They call it something else, Itra or something like that. But it's, it's kind of a lot like Mobile. Mobile is a, if, if Mobile got wiped out today, folks, somebody would rebuild it, wouldn't they? Why would they rebuild it? History. Rivers in the bay. Port town. Yeah, it's a port town. Folks, anytime you've got a river dumping into a body of water and you get cargo in and out, that's going to be a, a, a place where people gather. That's how Smyrna is. It's right where the uh, Hermes River dumps out into this bay. So it's, it, it sits there. But anyway, this general uh, rebuilt the city in 290 B.C. They then gave it the nickname, the city that rose from the dead, because it had laid their way so long. And in each one of these letters, you'll notice that the way Christ refers to it, he uses different uh, things that apply to the city. For instance, look in uh, verse 8. Under the angel, or the messenger of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now that's, a, that's an attribute that he, he said about himself in the first chapter, and each letter will contain one of them, but it also references the city, okay? So it, it's something they understood. All right? It, uh, it had a series of porticos in it, these porch-looking things. It was called the Crown of Smyrna. There's still some of it left today, but they, they refer to it as the Crown of Smyrna. And in the letter, he talks about, I'll give you a, a, a crown, a reward, a true crown. Um, it was also Rome's first ally in Asia. Now, that's important because they also went to build the very first temple to Caesar. Anywhere in the Roman Empire was built in Smyrna. Now... Every Caesar wanted to be worshipped as a god, didn't he? Is it anything new? Mm -hmm. Folks, that's been going on for the longest time. Pharaoh wanted to be worshipped as a god. Okay? But they literally built a temple there to Caesar. Now, imagine you're a Christian there in the first century and you're in the hub of Caesar worship. What's your life going to be like? You see why it's a persecuted church? Let me do it this way. How would you like to move in uh, to an apartment in the Vatican? Would you enjoy that? Would you even want to live in Rome today? Folks, you live in Rome. You're gonna have, let's just do it this way. Go to Rome and go out to get a job. Somewhere on that application is going to be a question asking you about you know, your race or whatever, but eventually what's going to come up? Religion. Your religion. You're going to have trouble getting work? Well, when the Jews had anyone that believed, what would they do to a believer? They put them out of the synagogue, cut them off, and so you find these Smyrnas are, are living in poverty, aren't they? And yet, are they starving to death? No, the Lord's taking care of them. So uh, this is just some of the things about this city. Now, have y'all ever heard of uh, Polycarp? You know, familiar with Polycarp? Polycarp actually wrote a letter, and we've got we've still got some of these things. He lived in the second century, but he was actually a disciple of John, the Apostle John. So he was John's disciple, and he became the bishop at Smyrna. He became the, the man that you know taught at the church. He, he was the, the pastor there at the church in Smyrna. Now, in 155 A.D., they burned him at the stake. Okay, so they, they killed him. Now, what was his crime? Religion. He preached the gospel. Yeah. He preached the gospel. And you say, well, why would they kill him for preaching the gospel? Well, I just preached the, the beginning truth of the gospel to you that there are none good. Now, how do you reckon that makes Caesar feel? Really bad. How about when you told people, them works you're doing are not going to save you? I mean, look, if, I, if, if we had a, a group of cats, if we were in Rome right now, we'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. in, in one form or another. See, how much would is, are you actually care? Do you care about a person? Or how much do you actually feel compassion for them? If you know that what they're believing has got them fooled and it's leading them straight to hell and you say, but I ain't going to say nothing, I might lose my job. Or I might, you know, get some ridicule. Do you really care anything about them? No, the care is to actually tell the truth, isn't it? So then whenever Polycarp preached in this city, guess what? They killed him. I'm going to read y'all his testimony. Maybe in the second class we'll read it. Um, he, what he said, because it's great. He, they burned him at the stake and he would not recant. At one point he told them, what are y'all waiting on? Get in the wood and let's go. 
Let's get on with this, you know. He was ready to die. Well, of course he was. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't concerned. All right, so it is a place where Polycarp died. And then the last thing I want you to notice about him is, if it was the, uh, the capital of Caesar worship and it came, became the capital of that religion, then what else was it? It's a port town with lots of commerce and it's the capital of a religion. They got plenty of money, don't they? And yet look what it says again in verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. How can they be rich if they're in poverty? Spiritually rich. Remember Christ said, don't lay your treasures up on earth, lay them up in heaven. Okay, now let's go look at a few verses. Go to Matthew 6. verse 19. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Now, you got to be careful and not be a fanatic here and go like some cults do. There are certain cults rise up and what do they tell their people? See, you can't have any money in the bank. You need to go drain your account and give it to me. That's been going on for years. Hasn't it? That's not what he's talking about. He didn't say, don't deposit money in the bank or don't save for next week's food. He didn't say that. He said, lay not up treasures now what's the difference? What's a treasure? Treasure, treasure is what you put your, your most value on. Treasure. Lay not up treasures, okay, upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Now you know, that's just natural. Anything you buy, it contaminates, doesn't it? You get a brand new car, and when you leave the lot, guess what? You just lost 25% of your value, you didn't you? Um, even, they say, yeah, but a house, it, it goes well. Sometimes houses go up, but what about the minute you move in the house? What starts happening physically? It might be gaining value if the economy's right. Maintenance. It's tearing up constantly, and the shingles are wearing out. Everything in this world suffers decay, doesn't it? But what about things in heaven? They don't. They suffer no decay. So basically, uh, he's using this figure of speech here about the moths and the rust because I might say it this way. What's going to happen to everything that you can see in this earth at the second coming? Burn. It's going to melt with fervent heat. Then, is it going to go away? Yeah. It might last you a lifetime, but can you take it with you? No. So he says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. See, he's not saying not to lay up. He's saying to lay up for yourselves the treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So then we know what the treasure is. The treasure is the object of your heart, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's the thing that you hold most valuable. Well, let me ask you all if, if your uh, house caught on fire and it was burning down and... and no kids or pets. Now, you got to only get one thing out of the house. And we live in a country where there ain't no getting another Bible. Y'all know how fortunate we are? You lose a Bible, you order another one. Not so in other parts of the world, folks. If that Bible was all you could get out of that house, would you? Yeah. Absolutely you would. What are you going to do without the Word of God? Now, don't say, well, I got my cell phone. No, I'm talking to <laughs> the, the point being is it's what you set your affection upon, isn't it? So when he's telling the people not to lay up treasures in heaven, what he's telling that church is, don't set your affections on the things of the earth. Now, do we have to have the things of the earth? Yeah. God made us where we got to eat, we got to have clothing, don't we got to have water, we got to have sleep. But what did God make us like that for? Why did God make humans that they have to have food? Depend on him. To depend on Him. What are we supposed to do at every meal? Thank, Thank Him for it. Come on, y'all know what we're talking about. God wants to be acknowledged for being gracious, doesn't He? Where's all our food come from? I asked that question and somebody told me Walmart recently. <laughs> but you see how our thinking gets, doesn't it? Alright, if God doesn't give the rain, what happens? We ain't got no food. 
We live in Mobile. We get 60 inches and we don't think like that. But read the Bible. When those people have turned from God, what did God do? He turned off the rain many times, didn't He? Droughts. You know, we're reaching a point in our country right now where, folks, it's just about the point of no return as far as turning our back on God. They're looking at people out here and shaking their fist at Him and making fun of Him. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And what happens in the Bible to every nation that has God's Word and the worship of God and they turn from it? Man, they, 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 they fall hard, don't they? So when he says not to lay your treasure up, again, we're talking about affection. Now, go over to uh, Luke 12. Let's read another one. Luke 12, 16. In Luke 12, 16, it says, And he, Christ, spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now, what's the first thing this rich man ought to do if his ground's bringing forth? Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord, right? He says, and he thought within himself. Does he go praying to God? No, he goes meditating within his own powers and philosophies. Saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? In other words, he's got so much, he can't fit it in his barns. I mean, imagine that. He's got so much food, he can't store it. He said, this will I do. Now, there's his main uh, problem, isn't it? This will I do. My will. What's God's will? He ought to be using it. God gave it to him. He ought to be using it properly, shouldn't he? So he says, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. My, now, my, 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 right? He said, I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, if that doesn't describe our country today, doesn't it? <laughs> really? I mean, literally, people think if, if you've got, you know, the, got some, a pantry full of food, you're in good shape. Well, okay. What happens when all your neighbors are starving? And you better have a pantry full of bullets too, right. have you? To keep your food. Yeah. So he says, but God said unto him, Thou fool. Now I want y'all to know this man is doing what comes natural, isn't he? Folks, natural is look out for number one. That's the result of sin. Look, Adam was created, and God had a relationship with Adam. God created man, and man is different. We did not come from monkeys and apes and animals. Folks, that's ridiculous. God created us and we're different. What makes man different than the other animals? We've got a soul. We've got a capacity to know God and to worship Him, don't we? Did Adam have that and did he have that relationship with God? Yes. And the moment Adam disobeyed, he was separated. And what did that leave Adam with? A void in that place. Can anything fill that void in fallen man? No. Folks, God made man so that God can dwell with man, and without God, man goes about looking to try and find something to make him happy, and can he? No. I mean, y'all think about all of life. Isn't life usually just one pursuit after another to find something that's going to make you happy? Yeah. I mean, and it never does, does it? No. He, the best example is new car fever. Y'all ever got new car fever? Everybody. I got it right out of high school. Last time I, I long, long ago quit ever buying anything new because it, no, I don't do that. But anyway, the, the point being is you get new car fever and you think if I can just get this car, that's going to make me happy, does it? No. No. By the third payment, you hate it, don't you? So we think, we, we plan things. We look forward to what's coming, don't we? I mean, I remember thinking, boy, if I could just make it to vacation, get some time off, or just whatever it is. Or we think that next meal is going to make us happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Me and Chris will go eat somewhere and we're both supposed to be eating better. And we sit down and say, boy, this looks so good. And when we leave, you know how we walk out of the restaurant? <laughs> Man, I feel horrible. Yeah. I'm miserable. <laughs> it don't. It doesn't feel. It, nothing in this world can satisfy that void. So man goes about chasing it and he dies over here with the void, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. So then when this rich man dies, did anything he ever did make him happy? And he's going to stand before the Lord, isn't he? So, he says to him, God said unto him, Thou fool, this night 
Thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Mm. Now, how many times have y'all seen a man work to amass a fortune and one generation of his kids just blow right through it? He, if you know it, James, you've seen investments like that, people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, God works His self. I mean, y'all look at all the guys that came back from World War II. They built our country. There were some hard-working dudes, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Hey, I remember, uh, I mean, just they, they, I mean, they really went to work and did it, didn't they? What happened to it? Folks, the dope dealers got it. And the, I mean, uh, you name it. It's just been blown through, hasn't it? So, if it's, nobody's saying you can't save money and give money for your kid. Nobody's saying that at all. What we're talking about is treasure, isn't it? What's this man's mindset? I'm safe because I've got these things. Is he safe? No. How are you going to be safe when your next breath might be your last one? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a verse in Isaiah that's wonderful. Isaiah is talking about what's coming on the Jews. And he says, God says to Isaiah, you tell them, what in the world are you doing trusting in man whose breath is in his nostrils? Now, what that you read it, what it really translates to is, how many breaths can me and you hold? One. One. Isn't life in that breath? Uh -huh. So then how much do I actually possess? The one that's in my nose right now. Is the next one guaranteed to me? No. no. God is in charge of this. And yet man thinks because the pantry's full, I'm good. Are you? No. If I drop dead right now, I know with everything in the pantry, it takes Sienna about two days to gnaw right through it. <laughs> like a government mule. I bought a box of pop tarts the other day. I, I, I kid y'all not, that thing had to be that big. It, it had multiple. It was the biggest one they had at Walmart. There it is, empty on the table in there. Hey, but the point being is that those are the things that we need, aren't they? Who set your affection on those things? What's our affection to be set on? Set on the Lord. What was the Smyrna's affection set on? The Lord. So what were they doing? They were in poverty and being persecuted, weren't they? But what did the Lord tell them they were? Rich. Rich? Yeah, where were all their deposits at? In heaven. Folks, that's where you want to make your deposits at. Alright, let's see. Go back over there to Revelation 2. Let's just go through here and break down some of these statements. First off in verse 8 he says, When the angel in the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now let's talk about that. I was dead, now I live. Alright? Were the, the people in Smyrna suffering persecution? Yeah. Who had already suffered persecution? Christ. Christ. Worse than they could ever imagine? Yes. And died at the hands of it. And yet where was he when he's talking? At the right hand of God. In other words, I haven't been through what you're going through. I know it seems horrible to you, but I've already passed through it. And what did he get because he passed through the suffering of, of all sufferings? What did he get for it? He's the inheritor of the entire creation, didn't he? So then has Christ already gone through anything me and you might have to go through? Yeah. Folks, there ain't nothing me and you could ever face that would be anything like what Jesus Christ had to face. Now, watch what the writer of Philippians says. You know, let's... Let, yeah, okay. No, go to Hebrews 2. Oh. I'm going to do this out of order a little bit. Hebrews 2, verse 9. He says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, did Christ leave glory and come down here and become a man? Can y'all think of anything more dishonoring that we could do than trust something else other than Him? He left glory and come down here and went through all that that He went through and I'm going to say there's another way I'm going to get saved? I mean, that's the most dishonoring thing you can do. How about the God the Father who gave His Son parted with Him for that time, watched Him suffer and die and go through all of that, and then you're going to say to Him, you did that for nothing. I'm good enough to get there by my works. That's crazy, isn't it? So it says here, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. 
Has Christ already suffered? Yeah. Is He crowned today? Yeah. Isn't that exactly what He promised the people in Smyrna? For their persecution? A crown? Yeah. He says He's crowned uh, with glory and honor that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. By the grace of God He tasted death? Does that look like grace when you read about it? Sounds horrible to me. But what was it? Grace. It's the grace of God. Grace toward His Son or towards me and you? Towards us. The grace of God that makes salvation free to me and you if we'll believe cost the Lord Jesus Christ everything. The grace of God that's being offered to us is unmerited favor. Who's the only one that ever had any merit? Christ. And what did He do with His merit? He laid it down at Calvary. So He says next, verse 10, For, or because, it became Him, it became Christ to do this, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. You mean everything was created by the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, yeah before He became flesh, the Bible's clear about it. In bringing many sons unto glory, you mean Christ is at the right hand of God now crowned with glory? Yeah. And he said he's going to bring more people there. Many sons crowned with glory like him. Well, if he suffered and is crowned with glory above all others, what would you expect those that go to be with him to do? They're suffering sometimes. And we're going to talk about this. I don't know if we'll get into it today. We're just going to take our time here. But don't always think persecution and think, uh-oh, nobody's trying to kill me. I'm not saved. That folks, that ain't, the word persecution means to be pursued after. It means it, there's a pressure and a testing here. Don't we all know something of it? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, don't you fight a battle daily if you're saved? Do you battle your flesh daily? Yeah. Flesh battles against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. Doesn't it? It's a struggle. So he says, "...in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings." Now, does that mean that Christ was not perfect and was a sinner and had to suffer to pay for it? No. no. What it means is he became the perfect captain of salvation by suffering, didn't he? Because what did he do? The first thing he did was he left glory, did he not? Mm -hmm. And he became flesh. In the womb of Mary, he's both the Son of God and he's also the Son of Man, isn't he? Well, what does that make him? If he's the son of man and he's the son of God, he's the perfect go-between. He's the perfect mediator, isn't he? Does he totally understand everything about God the Father and his position? Yeah. Does he know righteousness, hatred of sin, everything? Yeah. Does he know the glory that awaits his children? Mm -hmm. But has he also lived in a body of flesh? Does he know all the infirmities of the flesh? So then he became the perfect mediator, number one, by suffering, by leaving glory, and becoming what we are, didn't he? But he also now sits at the right hand of God as the Son of God and the Son of Man, as our mediator. And is there anything me and you can ever be tempted with, or any trial, or anything that could ever come our way that he doesn't understand? Mm -hmm. He's the perfect mediator, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, who makes the best of... He always used the baseball example. You all know what an arbitrator is in yeah. baseball? He, when they have a contract that they can't work out, a player thinks he's worth one figure and the owner says he's worth another. Sometimes, rather than go to free agency, they'll both agree to, to get an arbitrator. Now what they do is they say, we're going to hire a neutral party, and whatever he decides, both parties say we're going to accept, right? So that man is then a go-between, isn't he? Well, guess who the owners want to hire? Back they want to hire somebody that's an owner or been in management or something, right? Who's the player want to get? Player. A player. Well, who makes the perfect arbitrator? Oh, that's right. Nolan Ryan's an example. Nolan Ryan played for 140 years and then he turned around and he's uh, a president now, isn't he? I know he didn't play that one. He'd sound like he did. But the point being is he's the perfect go-between, isn't he? This is what a mediator does. And this is what Jesus Christ came down here to become for us. He became our mediator. Now, <clears throat> in verse uh, 11 it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. So that can you become a brother to the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. How? 
You join unto Him by faith. Look, it's not something that you can go... You can't go walk somewhere to get it. You can't walk an aisle in a church to get it. You can't get in water. You can't get it any other way but by faith, right? Hey, I walked in the, in the strength of something I did in a church building for years and thought I was safe. Then I went out and just lived like hell because I thought I wasn't going there. I mean, I'm just... Anything I wanted to do, I did it with complete immunity because I thought I took care of that. They told me after what I did that day, I'll never have to worry. Thank God He brought me to a point one night when I started to worry, and it got so bad it was pure misery worrying. I knew something. Man, you've been faking this. You might have them fooled, but you ain't fooling yourself, and you sure ain't fooling the Lord, are we? Hey, James said any true faith does what? It produces works that go along with it. Okay. Now, back over to uh, Revelation. Again, he says that he is that which was he is the one that was dead and is alive, and because of that, notice what he says in verse eleven. The second half says, "He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death." The second death? What in the world is the second death? What happens? It's appointed unto all men once to what? To die. What did Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles all teach is going to happen to every man over here? They're going to be resurrected. All people, folks, everybody will be resurrected. Don't let someone tell you, no, not everybody. The Bible says the just and the unjust will be resurrected. We all got to die once, right? And we're all going to be resurrected. But what happens to those that are resurrected that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? There's a change that takes place, isn't there? Mm -hmm. In the moment, the twinkling of an eye, and at the last trump, and what do we get? We're changed, and we're with the Lord. But what about those that aren't changed? They're resurrected, then what happens to them? They die the second death. How long does the second death last? Eternal. It's eternal. It, the place that they go is, is figuratively, in my opinion, called the lake of fire. Now, whether some say that's a real lake somewhere, I, I don't. that ain't even worth arguing to me. The point being is, are they forever separated from God and in misery? Yeah. Look, how would you like to just, re, just remain in the state that you're in right now for eternity? Some say, oh, that would be great. You really look at your state. He, there was a great scene one time in a Jack Nicholson movie. He, Jack Nicholson was nuts. And he had all these problems and whatnot, and he would go to the psychiatrist. He went to see a psychiatrist, and he come out. I can't remember the name of the movie, but he came out. And, no, it was uh, later than that one. That was a good one, though. He really wasn't nuts in that one. He was the only sane one in there. Uh, as good as it gets. That was the name of it. Y'all ever seen that one? He comes out, and he stops after seeing his psychiatrist, who didn't help him at all. That's... I ain't giving my opinion. <laughs> but he comes out and he stands in the uh, lobby and he looks up and there's one lady over there biting her nails like this and there's a guy crying and there's another one doing you know, and he just looks around at all of them and there's one just mad. And he looks and as serious as can be, he said, what if this is as good as it gets? And you heard one of them go, mm -hmm. like, no, don't say that. Well, folks, what if this is as good as it gets? your misery. How would you like to spend eternity without your body but your soul and spirit suffering the idea of knowing you ain't in the, in anywhere near the presence of your Savior? Never will be. Last thing you'll see, you'll be resurrected, you'll look on His face in glory, and the Bible says that when we look at His face, the joy of His countenance fills us. You, you couldn't, the feeling you couldn't describe, and there it is for just a second in what happens. Down you go. I mean, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? All right, go over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, there are those that would say, you know, if you're a Christian, why are you suffering like this? That something's wrong. The Lord doesn't love you or you're not saved or whatnot. Well, folks, what have Christians done for 2,000 years? 
They've suffered. Matter of fact, what have God's people done for 6,000 years? What did Cain do? Suffered at the hands of his brother. Who do the, the children of God normally suffer at the hands of? The professing believers that don't really believe. Folks, it's the religious people that kill people in the Bible most often. What was Cain? Cain was religious, man. He's there offering a sacrifice to God. You remember why he killed Abel? Because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. Cain's one that stood there and said, Lord, Lord, look what I brought you. And he said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So now in uh, Peter, 2 Peter 2, he says, verse 20, uh, 1 Peter 2, I'm sorry, y'all. 1 Peter 2, 20. He said, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. Now, how did Christ accept His suffering? He took it as it came. He says next, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now, before we take a break, let's say what he's saying here. When Christ came, did he suffer like nothing we've ever even imagined? Did he ever complain about it? Why did he complain? Because he knew the end. Well, he knew the end, but it says he knew God judgeth righteously. In other words, what did he say? This is God's will. Look, folks, do we really believe that God Almighty is in charge? Romans 8.28 says that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Do things just happen by happenstance like people say? Yeah. Folks, God is in charge. You remember Job thought things were just happening to him, didn't he? Horrible things. Were they? God allowed it to happen. Why? For His own good. His own good. Now, chastisement is something we go through and all these things, but Jesus Christ came and suffered everything He suffered because He knew God knows what He's doing. My Father knows what He's doing. Father, He said at one point the night before when it got so bad, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, Your will. So can't we say, like the Smyrnans would have said over here, can I say over here, I don't understand why I'm going through this, but I know one thing. God Almighty doesn't make mistakes. He does all things well. Ultimately, somehow this is going to be for my benefit, isn't it? And did it turn out that what the people in Smyrna were suffering was for their benefit? If they suffered it, what did they end up with? Crowns and glory. You know, it's, you suffer for anything you want. I mean, I don't care what it is. You say you decide you're going to run the Azalea Trail Marathon, right? What do you have to do if you're really going to run it? Train. you got to train. Now, is that going to be making some sacrifices? Oh, yeah. Is there suffering in training for one of them? Yes. Folks, I can't imagine running 26 miles. Seriously, I can't. I mean, I would if I started down Dolphin Street, I'd call Chris to come get me. <laughs> and when he came, I'd be at the Dairy Queen more than likely waiting <laughs> on him. But there's suffering there, right? Well, what makes somebody suffer like that? they got a goal. There's something they want. I remember when I uh, decided bodybuilding. I'm going to get in, boy, this bodybuilding. This is what I saw something. That's it. i got to do this. It literally started with a girl telling me in high school, broke up with me. We had this little fellow that had a bench set, so he had a little old chest. And I remember her telling me she going out with him. And I said, buddy, she said, go get some muscles and hung up the phone. Oh. <laughs> broke my heart. Just broke my heart, right? <laughs> it was, but that put it in my mind. But when I when I started bodybuilding, I knew right away, sugar, that ain't going to get it done. That ain't going to work. So guess what? Ten years, man, twelve years, I ain't eat no sugar. I mean, I might have had a little bit, maybe, you know, here and there. I didn't eat that. Man, I'm eating chicken and rice and steak and potatoes constantly. Skinless. Yes, skinless. But you say, well, how, how was you able to give up that sugar? I got a sweet tooth. Now, I'm telling you, I'm a sweet eater. Why could I give up the sugar? Because the gold was more important to me than the sugar. Even though the sugar tastes good, was my treasure in my taste buds? I had set my affections on something else, hadn't I? That's what he's trying to tell us. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. 
But the ladies are going to go win Miss America or something. Do they eat everything they want? No. Folks, they, some of them girls probably starved themselves. I mean, they. But what are they doing? They have they have a higher goal in mind, and that's their affection, isn't it? Well, if our affection is set on things in this world, right? What's going to happen to the the apple of your eye? It's going to produce nothing but joy and misery, and be gone, won't it? Well, what about if your affection set on things above and you deny the things of this world in order that you can do Jesus Christ's will and believe on Him and follow Him every single second you're doing that? What's it doing? It's putting rewards for you in heaven. And would those ever pass away? No. Folks, what would God be if He told you He'll reward you for things you do and then He doesn't reward you? He would be a liar and a thief and it's impossible. Okay? So uh, we, we kind of laid the groundwork there. I want to make sure we got the basics of the Gospel there. We'll take a break and we'll go back and start looking up the details in this thing of Smyrna.